All right, it's 2.01. <laughs> um, so I just want to say thank you all for coming, all of you joining us in person. Thank you all for all of you online as well. I just want to remind everyone this talk is being recorded today. Um, and that you can, um, the chat is disabled, but you can put your questions in the Q&A. We have um, someone monitoring the questions. And at the end of the talk, we will uh, attend to those questions. So I'm really excited to uh, welcome our speaker today. She's known to many of us at NIH. Um, my name is Carol Van Risen. I'm a nurse practitioner. I work in um, Chuck Venditti's lab. And I'm hosting uh, Dr. Genevieve Wojcik, um, known as Jen to most of us. Um, I think that Jen has a very interesting, um, has had an interesting journey. Um, she's been involved in genetics since her undergrad um, days, which I guess her name is appropriate. <laughs> um, so I first met her at the DNA Day lecture that she gave, and I was really impressed with how she um, talked about diversity and inclusion and how important that is in data sets. Um, I find it really um, appropriate that her lab is called the RAGE Lab, which is research on ancestry and genetic epidemiology, because one of the reasons she ended up in um, diversity and, and, and data sets was that she realized that when she was looking at data that people weren't always included, that if you checked too many boxes or you forgot to check a box, that you might not be included in data sets. So, um, let me tell you a little bit more about her. She's an associate professor of epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore. She did her undergraduate at Cornell University and then did her master's and PhD at Johns Hopkins. Uh, she also did a postdoc at Stanford. Um, her, as I mentioned, she has a focus in um, genomic research, looking at populations that, in, and she's hoping to include uh, minority groups within the United States that are admixed, drawing recent genetic ancestry from two or more continental populations. And when you look at the, the people that participate, for instance, in the Olympics, I think it's important to notice that it, the United States delegation is probably one of the most ethnically diverse populations that was represented. In many of the countries, you see a very homogeneous um, group of people, but at the US, even our gymnastics team, I mean, this is something really important um, to make sure that our data represents the country that we live in. Um, I also want to mention that she has done work on infectious disease and vaccine response, and her thesis uh, was on polio. Um, and polio is also having a resurgence in the world today. So she's a very great speaker. I've heard her speak before. And I, without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker, uh, Jen Wojcik. Take it away. Hi, thank you for the very kind introduction. And I'm happy to be here. Um, I see some familiar faces. All right, we'll get started, though. Okay, so uh, I was here eight months ago. I guess giving a different talk, and I've tried to make some things a little different, so it's not completely redundant as before. Uh, but let's get into it. So today, what I'm going to talk to you about is what we think about with polygenic scores, particularly how when we think about how we model these scores, it's important to consider ancestry, but also environment and how they intersect. And so a much more um, comprehensive look of how we model human health and what that means for the methods that we use. And so I want to start by saying, you know, genetics is a field which is sort of unique, I think, amongst a lot of fields in that we're very um, centered around an exposure, right? We're very centered about an exposure, and that shows up in our priorities, sort of what we focus on. Now, most of the time, you know, we're thinking about questions about how to model the role of genetics in a certain trait. Uh, and for many studies, we can only really look at the genetics and that trait. It's a very straightforward relationship. But the problem is that there's a lot of other stuff going on as well that affects everything else, right? So I'm from the field of epidemiology. We love our directed acyclic graphs, which you sort of see right here in terms of how things relate to each other. Um, and often we ignore a lot of the other parts to try to really isolate the relationship between genetics and the trait. Uh, but we can't, right? Because we're looking at populations, all these things matter. And even for individuals, they all matter. And so we fail to sort of account for them, which results in sort of lower uh, predictive accuracy for the individuals and for populations, 
Um, and also, we just haven't found a lot of pathways that could be interesting for follow-up. Additionally, you know, a lot of times these things below here, including racial and ethnic identity, how that relates to sociopolitical context, and then how that relates to social and structural determinants of health, are often ignored wholesale in genetics research. Um, and often, you know, it's sort of a consequence of how we have our methodologies and frameworks set up, where we have a flattening of populations, where people are sort of flattened into only one descriptor, and that is sort of a very broad descriptor. And so it's important that we sort of address these sort of foundational issues in our field before we can address sort of the further downstream aspects. And the aspects that I'm thinking about here are sort of, we know there's, there's vast genomic health inequities, right? We know that a lot of the technology that we put out there, a lot of the new methods we have are vastly better in some groups versus others. Um, and it's important for us to interrogate how we got here so that we can sort of interrupt that cycle and do better moving forward. And so like, why do we keep on making the same mistakes over and over again? You see this in data sets over and over again in terms of a lack of representation, in terms of this idea that there's some sort of trickle-down economics at play here, which don't work, and then eventually we'll get to everybody else, which is not the case. So we have to sort of nip that in the bud. And I would say it's, it's turtles all the way down, right? And by turtles all the way down, I mean it's sort of what we accept as the default. What in science do we accept as the default when it comes to these economic health inequities, including access to this healthcare, poor performing tools, if we go further down to translation, often a lot of these translation papers um, assume that the participants are all white. They don't even mention it in the methods because it's from a biobank. Um, and often a lot of these biobanks historically have been predominantly uh, white in terms of racial backgrounds and European ancestries in terms of genetics. If you go further beyond that to discovery, um, historically, again, a lot of the out-of-the-box methods were for a single ancestry, sort of assuming homogeneous sort of population ancestry there. Um, and that has changed somewhat. So there's been some uh, progression in that, but there's still some limitations for some methods on this front. And then even further back, in terms of diverse ancestries and populations, who we are recruiting and how we even measure their genetics. It was only very recently that chips for genotyping were developed uh, that could capture variation across global populations on a single chip. For that, it was very uh, sort of tailored, particularly to a European backbone. And so. What we accept as the default um, is really important here, and it shows up in our data. So one way of looking at it is in the GWAS catalog, it's a curated data set of all published genome-wide association studies. Here, you, know, you often see the total number of participants, which is important to see. What I'm showing you here is the average sample size in the published studies, which is sort of a rate-limiting step when we think about statistical power. Um, and I'm showing you the annual trends in the dashed lines and the cumulative knowledge base in the sort of solid lines here. And what you can see, starting in about 2017, this is around when the UK Biobank became more in widespread use and published on, you see this spike in the mean sample size, but only for the European ancestry groups, right? Everyone else stays pretty stagnant. And you can see this even when you zoom in, right? Even as we have these orders of magnitude increases in the European ancestries in the GWAS catalog, uh, you don't see that in anybody else. It, and despite these, there being a large number of participants, the average sample size per study stays the same. And so we're still very limited in our discovery power um, for these very foundational kind of studies that we do in genetics. And this has long sort of reaching ramifications for other studies done in genetics and genomics. So one thing was in polygenic scores. Um, this was a study uh, looking last year at all published polygenic scores, where you sum across the entire genome for what is um, what genetics is associated with a particular outcome. What I'm showing you on the left hand, of, well, I guess, yeah, on the left hand side here, is the proportion of all published polygenic scores with European ancestries participants. Um, the ones in solid, sort of blue blocks, are they only have European ancestries included for these polygenic scores? And then in the middle, I'm showing you any PGS that includes anybody who is identified as being Hispanic. Um, African-American or Afro-Caribbean. And so you can see it's a much, much smaller number of people. And then on the right hand side, what you see is the 2020 U.S. Census, right? So it is not reflective of the U.S. population, the general population. It's not reflective of where, which communities are disproportionately impacted by these outcomes that we're doing polygenic scores for. Uh, and so we have this disconnect that's going to have a long tail because of the lack of investment early on. And so we just don't have the data because often PGS are built from GWAS. Um, and so you have these consequences that occur and they keep on coming, coming year after year after year. And so you see these long tails of things happening. Now, if we go back to that framework, you could say, okay, like that's great, awesome. 
Um, but where do you start? That's a big framework. It's a lot of things going on. And so what I hope to show you today is a way of systematically going through this in genetics, sort of a pet one path forward um, to how we can build our knowledge base to do better across diverse groups, right? And so we're going to go through this one relationship by another um, and look at the knowledge base, both from work within my group, but also from the literature to sort of see what a better way forward is. All right. And again, if you have any questions, you can feel free to interrupt me in the middle. That's fine with me. OK. So the work that I'm showing you today um, is going to be done in the PAGE study. So the PAGE study is the population architecture using genomics and epidemiology. It is a long-run study started in 2008 uh, by NHGRI, when already there was recognized to be a problem um, with an underrepresentation of minoritized groups in genetics research. And so this is from particularly the 2013 to 2018 uh, waves, so page two. Uh, and these are the numbers. So this is all self-identified um, identities where, <coughs> pardon me, Hispanic Latino was about 22,000 individuals, uh, African American 17,000, and then smaller groups of Asian, um, Native American, Native Hawaiian, and others. Uh, the others actually have a large proportion of South Asian individuals who didn't feel like Asian described them well enough, and so we're in the other category. Uh, so it's a caveat. Also, um, you know, it is reasonable to think that 50,000 people is not a lot of people, but you have to remember, this was 10 years ago when it was enough people. It was quite the achievement. We were very proud of that. By the time we actually published that, it was not as much of an achievement, which goes to show you how fast things move. Okay, so for this particular vignette, what I'm going to be showing you is three um, is, is where we're going to focus things down, right? I'm not going to show you across all participants. What I'm really interested in looking at is just in one population that is often assumed to be homogeneous, right? You pool everyone together and you assume that they're all the same and therefore they should be exchangeable within one group, um, which I think most people uh, would on its face say is maybe a little ridiculous to include everybody who identifies as Hispanic as a single sort of homogeneous group, but that's what we're going to look at. And for the trait, we're going to look at body mass index. Okay? And now this is not the most clinically relevant trait. I'm fully aware of that. But it does provide us a really good toy example or an example to go through things uh, because it is a complex trait that has very strong differences in genetics and environment across groups. So it helps us illustrate the point without it being um, particularly for clinical outcomes. So it's been well shown before. I'm not going to go into it for this, this talk. but. That PRS, these polygenic scores, so again, these tools summing the genetic liability, the genetic scores across the entire genome, um, when you train them and then you create this one score per person, they perform differently between these sort of very coarse categorizations of genetically similar groupings of humans, right? So we know that there's been a lot of literature over the past few years showing this. I'm not going to go too much into it. But my question is, how is this complicated by recent admixture or diversity of genetics um, within a single group? So we, you know, often in research, you'll, you'll lump people together. Um, but what happens when there's substantial substructure on the genetic side within that one group? And then what is, how it happens um, when it's further complicated by the heterogeneity and environment from that one group? So when one group you're assuming to be relatively, you know, exchangeable with each other, you're having those assumptions, um, is not actually that exchangeable with each other because their genetics is very different, because their environment is very different, what does this mean for our polygenic scores? Okay. So we're going to do this, and we're going to show you some of these relationships here. Uh, but we're going to start off first at um, just looking at the polygenic score and, and BMI. I'm particularly focusing first on the population genetics aspect of this. So this is probably maybe the most well-trodden area of polygenic scores, what we're doing, um, but what effect that is. So let me orient you first to PAGE. This is the principal components analysis for those of you who are not familiar. Each dot is a person. They are colored by how they self-identify within the data set. Um, and then you're showing here basically with principal components analysis, for those who aren't as familiar with it, people who are closer together on the plot are more genetically similar. Those who are further away from each other are less genetically similar to each other, right? And what you should see off the bat is that there is no discrete groupings across these, these groups, right? There's no single line you could draw and say, on this side of the line, these people are X, on this side of the line, these people are Y, right? There's, it's just not possible. And you can see on the right-hand side, uh, moving further out, PCs one through five, right? So you can go further out for that. And also, just to further orient you, you have Africa, sort of the African component being pulled out to the right there. You have East Asia to the top there. You have the Americas, sort of the back left. You can't really see in 3D, but sort of back to the left. Uh, and you have Europe at the bottom for a variety of reasons. 
And so you see, again, a lot of diversity without discrimination of where people are, right? The idea that you could have a single person and tell from here exactly how they self-identify breaks down for a lot of these groups. Okay. So let's say that we want to get further into this idea of how particular membership within Hispanic Latino sort of umbrella category works when it comes to ancestry. And so it's important for us to delve in a little deeper as to what do we actually mean when we say Hispanic Latino with genetics research, right? What are we actually trying to say it is? And what is it, where does it break from those expectations and assumptions? And so we can look at this in page. What I'm showing you here on the right-hand side is everybody who identifies as Hispanic or Latino. Um, they are sort of they cover all the different axes of those individuals. You'll see what you think are some outliers, but I think it's important to note that doesn't mean that there are mistakes, right? It doesn't mean there's an error. Identity is complex, and it doesn't always align with what we think it does with genetics. And then we also see that if you color people further by how they further self-identify, so Paige has really rich data in which people are allowed to further self-identify um, for the Caribbean as Puerto Rican, Cuban, Dominican, or for the Americas, Mexico, and then Central America and South America were both um, aggregated for numbers. And you see there is substructure, right? You see where some clumps are, and this is because of unique demographic histories of those people, right? And so we know this, there's been other pop gen papers looking at this, that you have significant substructure within those groups. Now, if we go a little further, this is an admixture um, plot. For those of you who aren't familiar, each vertical line is a person. Uh, the proportion of their line with a certain color is sort of what proportion of their genome is most similar to sort of this latent component in the, in the algorithm. And what you can see here is that there's immense diversity. And so I'm focusing two in here, two um, recently admixed groups, African-American and Hispanic Latino within PAGE. And what you can see is that people can identify as African-American and be run the gamut from a lot of African or European, and there's others mixed in there as well. Um, but then also Hispanic Latino, right? You see a lot of diversity from multiple components here that have been inferred. And what I want to show you here is at the bottom, right? So if you allow people to further identify, you can sort of see more clearly the differences in the genetic makeup of these groups. Now, I think it's important to note that if I picked a single person, I could not tell you how they self-identify, right? It doesn't work that way. But what I could do is say there are differences on average between the groups that might be relevant for the questions I'm asking. Right. So again, for a particular person, I cannot tell you how they self-identify. It doesn't go that way. But when we look in aggregate at groups, you can make some conclusions, and it has effects on the science that we do when we consider genetics across these groups. All right. All right, so we've already established these relationships right, between group membership and ancestry. We just showed that with the different admixture and the PCA. We know that ancestry affects SNPs. We're relying on prior um, database, you know, on basic population genetics on that front. And so let's go and look at the literature more clearly about, how about this relationship here, right? To be a confounder, you have to be both associated with the exposure and the outcome. And so let's see how it relates to the outcome. So for this, I'm not going to redo the science. I'm going to rely heavily on previous research, which is very um, extensive and, and a lot of good work. And here are some studies that focus in the Hispanic Community Health Study and Study of Latinos, which is a multi-site longitudinal study looking at mostly cardiovascular and cardiometabolic health in Hispanic Latino individuals. And what they've shown before is that when you look at between these different groups, how they can self-identify, you see differences in BMI and weight gain trajectories. This is after controlling for what you would typically think of as different sort of socioeconomic status variables, as well as geography, which differs between often these groups because things are correlated due to migration structures. Um, and then also they see differences in the burden of cardiovascular disease risk factors, okay, between the populations for both men and women. So we know from literature that this is established, and so we can really firmly establish that there is potentially a confounding relationship between a further ethnic identification within the Hispanic Latino umbrella um, and then your genetics to BMI relationship here. And we can see further on, we'll see in a minute, what that actually manifests as uh, for the science, the results of how well these scores perform. So we're going to look at that. What happens when this is compounded genome-wide in a polygenic score? Okay, and for this, we applied maybe an older score of BMI PRS to page, the 2019 Kara et al. paper, um, where the PRS is actually trained on all European ancestries participants. Uh, so keep that in mind as well for this. And so we applied it to all of PAGE um, and then compared it to their actual phenotypes, and this is what we got. So here you can see that the performance of the PGS differs between groups. I'm, on the y-axis, I'm showing you the adjusted R-squared, so essentially what proportion of the variation of the trait that we're explaining with these models. 
Uh, the full model also adjusts for age, sex, and study in here, and so I've separated out <coughs> into the base model and the lighter shading, and then the PGS, so you can see the actual partial R squared, what the actual genetics is contributing. Um, and so you can see, first of all, that the score, including the base model, does differently between the two, all the different groups, right? So the same risk score applied to all these different groups, same platform, same weights, performs differently, explains different distributions of the outcome in these different groups, so we already know that. So we know before from previous research that polygenic scores perform differently across these different broad ancestral groups. What I'm showing you here that might be a little different is that it also performs differently within what we typically think of as sort of a homogenous group um, if these further sort of granular groupings. But what I want to show you is that it's not just about the full model, but also where the base model and the PGS differ. What you can see is if you realign to them here, how much of the variation is explained by just age, sex, and study, because pages four different studies put together, and how much is explained by just the polygenic score. And so what you see here uh, for the polygenic score is what you'd probably expect, um, given that the, the score was trained in European ancestries. Uh, where the lowest performance of the polygenic score is in the Dominican um, participants with the most African ancestry. And then what I think is interesting, though, is that it's not just about the factors not explaining anything, because you have the same populations where a lot of the variation is explained by age, sex, and study, right? So you have here what you typically think of, you know, geneticists would like to think that everything that's not genetics is environment, so maybe you categorize this as the environment, but the environment matters more. Uh, for some groups versus others, right? So it's not consistent about what the total model does, but parsed into genetics and environment, also different contributions in these different groups for these basic things. Now, you might be saying, okay, that's, that's fine, but let, you know, why don't we just adjust for everything, right? It's a favorite thing of us making models, let's just adjust, let's add more terms, let's adjust for it, and everything will be great, right? It'll perform better, don't have to think about it ever again. Um, and the, the problem is that it's, that's not the way it actually works, right? So for this, what I'm showing you here is that if I actually do adjust for group membership, the performance of the model overall goes down. It actually decreases the performance of what we're actually explaining. And that's because some of these relationships are real, right? Some of these differences between groups are real. And so when you adjust for the group membership, you're losing valuable information that predicts the outcome. And if the goal of your project is to just predict no matter how you want to predict it, then maybe you don't want to adjust for these things. So what I'm showing you here is on the top left-hand side, these sort of bar charts. Um, you can see that when it comes to the top quintiles, the Puerto Rican individuals are much more, are higher represented in this group compared to the others. Um, in this sample, again, it should be noted, this is, this is you know, particular to this sample here. And then you see when you look at the distribution for the PGS as well, they are shifted, right? And so you have both the shifting of the outcome and the PGS, and when you adjust it away, you lose that information. And so it's not a matter of just adding more and more terms. We like to just put everything into these models, maybe apply some AI or machine learning, and they just say put all the terms and explain as much as you can. But really what that does is obfuscates what's actually going on in that population and might help um, to, to, to make it really difficult to see what's going on. So you see this overrepresentation, distribution shifted. And again, the largest adjustment in how, thing, how this does is in that Puerto Rican population. So the, the betas, so the top decile, I think it's quintile here, compared to everyone else, the biggest change is in the Puerto Rican group because you're adjusting out that real relationship, right? And so this is also has ramifications for equity, when we think about equity, and that it's not enough just to put everything into the model and then see how it does, but if you want things to be equitable and you want them to be grounded in where the burden of whatever the outcome is or a certain trait that you're trying to predict, you have to sort of go under the hood here and find out exactly what's going on. Um, otherwise, you could miss a lot of things. Yeah. 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 No, no, it's a blob. It's always a blob. Look how small the R squareds are. <laughs> Yeah, no, again, it's all, it's all very, it's a blob, it's a blob. I mean, I, it should be noted that with BMI, the proportion variance explained is very small, right? And so this is meant to illustrate what could go on. BMI is not going to have a very high R squared because its heritability is lower. Its heritability is estimated to be about 40%. So if that's the ceiling you can get to, and these are, you know, older scores, it's going to be pretty low. So, yeah, yeah, no, it's... um. If you look at the scatter plot, it, it's not, you wouldn't be able to see anything with your eye. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I do know this. I, I have looked at the data. I don't think it's incredible, but sort of, uh, we're all looking at relative trends here, not the actual absolute values. Yeah, which is also why um, a PGS for BMI is not relevant for anything, really, besides looking at what's going on under the hood. Okay. All right. All right. So it's just a matter of adjustment. No, we don't just have to throw more and more things into the model if we want to know what's going on. That is not going to solve our problem of wanting to have the best model that undercovers a lot of these relationships. Okay. All right. So let's keep going. All right, so now we've dealt before with this idea of the genetic scores, um, looking at these different backgrounds in the, in the model we showed before. But how about if we move again to these sort of social and structural determinants of health and um, the more environmental side of things, okay? So when we think about the environment, you know, I think as geneticists, when we move into environmental research, a lot of people um, get caught up because environmental research is very, very complicated, especially because as geneticists, we think that everything that's not genetics is environment, which environmental epidemiologists absolutely hate that we do that. Um, but the idea is that there's a lot of different things at different levels for environment, right? So we can go all the way from genetics and genomics and the multi-omics at this sort of small micro scale, all the way to the macro scale through more of individual level factors, interpersonal related factors, neighborhood related factors, and societal related factors, okay? And so there's increasing scales that require different methods for each one of these because of the scale and the structure that you have to account for. And so this is especially to remember as relevant because in GWAS, when you're focused on discovery, you have individual metrics, right? And that's okay because you're looking for discovery, you'll follow up with functional analyses, you know, that sort of thing. But when you move from GWAS to population level distributions and polygenic scores, you have to really consider this multifactorial risk, right? And what that means with your study design and what it means with the methods that you use. You can no longer use just a straight out logistic regression to do everything because these factors act at different levels that need to be accounted for. All right. All right, so let's go back here. We're gonna look at some individual factors here in the study and then also zoom out from social and structural determinants of health. Okay. All right, so one thing that's noted is that polygenic scores are just a, they're built off of GWAS, which are basically just a bunch of correlations, right? It's a bunch of correlations looking across the genome, and therefore it can pick up on any other factors that are correlated with the outcome of interest and genetics in your study population in which it was trained. And so we can ask the question, okay, you know, the polygenic score is explaining some amount of variation in the trait, but what is that polygenic score actually capturing, right? What is it actually picking up? And so what we're looking at here is we just sort of switch the equation around. Instead of BMI being the outcome, now we have the polygenic score as the outcome. And then we see which of these factors explain the most variation. And so we see overall, this man continuum individuals, that about 18% of the variation in the polygenic score is explained by ancestry differences. Here AME represents um, amerindigenous ancestry within these groups. And only about 3% of the variation in the polygenic score is actually explained by the BMI, right? which goes to Larry's point that only a small amount of variation is explained by the polygenic score. And this is very typical for these very complex, very environmentally influenced traits that we have polygenic scores for, right? these sort of small R squareds. Now what's interesting is that if you stratify, and here I'm looking at the two largest groups within PAGE, the Mexican participants and Puerto Rican participants, um, it, just, it differs, right? And so here, the variation in the score is actually picking up different amounts of variation in the ancestry, and this is partly because of ancestry differences between these groups. You have a lot more amerindigenous um, ancestry within the Mexican participants and Mexican-American participants of PAGE. Uh, and then BMI also slightly differs. But what's really what I want you to focus on here is that what happens when we further stratify by smoking? Now smoking you can see as an individual level risk factor, right? And so it shouldn't affect what the genetics is doing, it shouldn't affect that. Um, but what it does, again, because the polygenic score is built off of a bunch of correlations of which smoking was part of that study. And what you can see here is that when you look at the Mexican and Mexican-American participants, there isn't a big change between ever and never smokers. The, the same amount of variation is explained by their ancestry and the same amount of variation is explained by the BMI. But if you look at the Puerto Rican participants, it's different, right? You have almost twice as much of the, the variation in ancestry being um, explained by ever smoking, by the, the amerindigenous ancestry, and then you have the same for BMI. So again, you have differences in ancestry and what's being picked up by your risk score by different environmental variables. Again, what you're showing here is not that smoking changes your genetic code, but rather that these lifestyle factors, 
are indicative of the kinds of study populations you're having in your training set, and that carries forward into your scores further on. And when you're applying to them to other groups, it's important to note those dynamics, right? A polygenic score is not looking at just causal genetic factors. It's just looking at a bunch of correlations, millions and millions of correlations across the genome, um, which doesn't always pick up just the causal stuff, and usually it doesn't. Okay. So we see here there's differences in the group membership and how smoking affects the relationship between a polygenic score and BMI. Now we can zoom out a little bit more for social and structural determinants of health. So for those of you who don't know social and structural determinants of health, it's a mouthful, uh, what you see here is that there, um, the CDC categorizes these five basic sort of categories here of education access and quality, healthcare, uh, the neighborhood and built environment, social and community context, and economic stability. Okay, so there's a lot of different things that fall into this umbrella, both at an individual level as well as more geospatial and structural within the geopolitical context. And so why do we care about this? Well, first of all, we know that there are differences in ancestry by geography, right? This is an old study from 23andMe looking at people who identify as Hispanic or Latino in this case um, across the United States. And what you can see is people who identify the same way have different backgrounds depending on where they are geographically which matters when we think about structural determinants of health. And it matters because there is a lot of differences in, in the heterogeneous structure when it comes to these across the United States. Here, what I'm showing you is a, a racism measurement model, looking at county structural racism. Um, they have a lot of different metrics that are put into here, uh, including things about housing, schooling, so a lot of those different the, the categories I just showed you from CDC. And what they found is that this high county structural racism was associated with higher BMI in black participants and lower in white participants. Um, and this is even after adjusting for county income uh, where there was more money and a lower BMI, right? And so you have the structural factors that can influence the trait here. And the, alongside the fact that you have structural factors that correspond with geography and the geography can change the ancestry, you see how they're all sort of interrelated. And so we look at these national data sets like all of us or anything like that and you have these factors and you're bringing in the environment to this, it's important to consider the geographic context, the social call context of that, um, because it can differ, right, along with the genetics. So they're not separate, they're all interconnected. And so let's go back to the question at hand for us in the Spanish Latino groups. And so what kind of structural racism could be at play for our groups? And so for this, we can look at the for BMI in Hispanic Latino groups, again, relying on um, these longitudinal epidemiological studies and what, one of the strongest predictors of moderate and extreme obesity was the length of residency in mainland US among immigrants in the United States. So not acculturation, it was not associated with acculturation, but rather how long you're exposed to the obesogenic environments of the United States. And this is consistent across different groups. And so we have this relationship between an environmental factor of immigration and time spent in the United States um, that could influence, again, these structural factors with these outcomes to take into account. And so, Building off of this, to bring it all together in this big model, I was lucky to be part of this project with Lindsay Fernandez Rhodes, who led this project with her um, then postdoc, uh, Kristen McCardle, looking at um, how does a polygenic score and what it can predict differ by when um, somebody immigrates to the United States, right? So just age immigration. What I want to show you here, there's a base and a full model. Their full model is very extensive, includes educational lifestyle factors, um, typical biomarkers, demographics. The important part is that, first of all, that it is predictive, and that also there is a relationship between age of immigration um, altering how predictive a polygenic score is. So here you're showing people age of immigration between, um, right here, so those who immigrated to the United States, constantly US, before the age of six, so they weren't born in the United States but came before the age of six, their interaction effect here is positive, which means that their score works better than those who moved after the age of 20. Right, so a polygenic score within the same group will perform worse based on, according to this, when somebody immigrates to the United States. Right? And this is adjusted for how long they've been in the States for. And so that's important to know not only how long, but when, right, in childhood or adulthood. Now we want to get back to sort of more granular substructure within this group, and so you can look further. Um, and what I want to show you here is like we showed before with a more simple model, there are differences in performance between these groups where you have much higher performance of the full model in some groups, in this case, a South American group, compared to others, which is the, the Mexican-American group here. Um, I also want to show that 
the effect of the polygenic score itself, not just the full model, but the polygenic score itself specifically also differs between these groups. So how much the polygenic score can actually predict or capture BMI differs between these groups. But what I want to show you too is that environment also changes, right? So that, that effect size we had before about what age of immigration affects the outcome um, is different based on which group it is. And that is because these groups moved to the United States to different places in the United States at different times for different reasons, and therefore that results in different environments, right? And so you cannot think that these groups have a sort of standardized, um, sort of uniform exposure when it comes to environment just because we want to put them in one bucket. I've told you before that there's no sort of uniformity when it comes to genetics. And so that sort of calls into question their use as an analysis unit in our studies if the goal is to have exchangeability, okay? And so the cold is like, it gets a little bit complicated, right? And I've really just used the past half an hour of your time to just point out problem after problem after problem. I have not given you any solutions. And so we're going to spend a little time trying to have some solutions to help us move forward. Because I think, you know, I don't love being a Debbie Downer. So we're going to see what we can do. Okay. So, you know, I think one of the things that needs to happen is that we need to find a better way to define our populations for a specific scientific question. We have a tendency to define them in the data cleaning step and then use those same definitions through every analysis further on, but that's not really going to be appropriate for many questions. Uh, this is a, a quote to, to group is natural, but there are no natural groupings. Um, I heard John Novembro say it. He denies ever saying it, so I, I didn't officially put the, the acknowledgement there, but that's where I heard it. Um, and so, you know, this barrier is that there's imprecision as to how we define our study of populations now, right? It's very difficult to have accountability and assess equity without this, um, this, this precision. And to know exactly, you know, how relevant are our studies to actual people, right? If we have these very fuzzy definitions in our studies, how do they relate? How do people who are reading it know how it relates to them, right? How do people in the clinic know that it relates to them? And this includes a wide variety of contexts like race, ethnicity, genetic ancestry, uh, geographic location, social context, and many other demographics. And this is illustrated really well, I think, within the GWAS catalog, where in order to catalog things and to have some level of accountability, they had to include a lot of different things. And so here you have their definition for European, and it combines a bunch of things like genetic ancestry. Here you have the genetic clustering um, with 1,000 genomes and HapMap. Geography, so in this case, it's, it's the continent of Europe. Uh, racial terms, which is Caucasian and white, and then nationality as Dutch. So all these different constructs are combined to have this one attempt at sort of accountability. And this is, I mean, I don't blame them for doing this. This is what you had to do, right? You have to do this to have some level of harmonization to look at the data and evaluate the knowledge base uh, together. And so, but this is sort of complicated because it really puts a lot of different concepts together. And it's hard to know how comparable these studies are within this umbrella um, when they're pulling from very different concepts. And this is because the fundamental tension we have when it comes to genetics versus sort of the more broader questions is that we're trying to capture two different things, right? When it comes to the genetic side of things, for a lot of QC steps, a lot of methods, you have to have this level of homogeneity in the population without substructure. And so you're trying to get that from a technical standpoint. And then you have the societal context where race, ethnicity are real. They exist as social constructs and they have real consequences for health, right? And so you have to reconcile those two options between the technical motivations and the downstream interpretations of what the data is happening with the idea that they, they aren't the same thing, right? They, they're not the same thing. They, they don't overlap as much as we think they do. Um, and they have very different interpretations by the wider um, community. Okay, so on one hand, we have the genetic ancestry and the other race in the city. So a report came out, um, now I guess it was, it was spring and a half ago, uh, but uh, this is from the NASMA committee, which I was part of, on population descriptors and genetics and genomics. Uh, with the idea of saying that, you know, we need to bring a lot of disciplines together to have some guiding principles and recommendations for how to handle these questions in genetics and genomics research. Uh, and really, it comes down to really just emphasizing the need for being a, very careful in aligning how we describe populations, how we define them, with the research question at hand, right? Again, acknowledging there is no sort of innate factor that can categorize people. It's all about what question you're trying to ask and how you're doing it and what data you have at the at time. Right? And so, you know, again, a very simple sort of thought, but very complex to do in reality, given the, the complexities of data that we work with. So one thing I want to show you for here is a sort of some preliminary evidence for this of method that might be, you know, addressing part of the problem. 
Um, but the idea is if your goal is genetic similarity, then you should just group by genetic similarity, right? You shouldn't be using these broad social construct sort of terms to capture what you are trying to do. You have the data, just do what you need to do for the data. And I tell you, this will not likely fall on the racial ethnic lines you think it is, particularly with recently admixed groups, where there's a lot of both diversity within the group and shared ancestry across the groups. And I want to say, you know, this is especially important for us as we move towards this sort of data-driven, right? It's, it's data-driven is everywhere, but driven where, right? Where is it driving us to? Um, and letting you know that there's, you, you cannot have a better solution if the input is faulty, right? If the assumptions are faulty. Uh, and so, you know, this goes to a lot of methods that rely on current reference data, which already exists, and it, ref, it, it relies on social constructs for how people were recruited and how they were grouped together. And this increased use of, of um, AI and ML often obscures some of these decisions within the algorithm. And I'll show you one example of this. So this is an example from a paper that's in the supplement of methods, so you have to dig it up. Um, but the idea is that in the genetics, they use a clustering algorithm. I think there's a random forest classifier for this. But they said, okay, people, you know, you have a post, you have likelihood for who you belong to, which group you belong to. And if somebody belongs to more than two groups, right, if your likelihood is above 0.3, we're gonna arbitrarily assign you to this group over this group, this group over this group, right? And I want you to notice what they arbitrarily assigned groups over. So they directly fall on the lines of hypodescent, the one drop rule, and not only that, it recapitulates further the sociological concept of the low, which is the axis of subordination, right? Which has the distal, how distal you are from this whiteness is perfectly recapitulated in above the, again, arbitrary decisions of the algorithm of where you're classified, right? And so it's important to know that even if the data drives us here, even if we use the methods, even if it's only for a few people or a small number of the portion of people we're using, you can still use these methods to recapitulate racist policies and have that follow through in many, many, many papers, right? And so it's important for us to question these usages because they're not valid from an epidemiological standpoint. I've showed you here there's a lot of structure within these groups. And it's not valid from a genetic standpoint because you'll notice that they apply African over a lot of these groups, when Africa is the most diverse continent, and over everybody, they put Hispanic Latino or Americas here, which is not, again, genetic grouping, it's a very diverse group and covers two continents, right? And so again, you have this idea where you're not actually doing anything scientific, you can put numbers to it, you can put these rules to it, doesn't mean it's actually scientific, it's assumptions that you're putting on this, and we need to avoid this, okay? Just the idea that machines are not gonna solve all our problems, um, if anything, you know, singularity is an issue. Okay, so what can we do instead? So here I'm showing you just a brief vignette of a possibility of one thing we need to tackle. And this is a postdoc in my group, Amber Satori, um, who's working on personalized reference sets. So when you do polygenic scores and you're taking a person and you wanna know, okay, it's a relative measure, how do they relate to other people, right? You come up with groups. And typically these groups are very broad, like African. Right, which anybody who has any African ancestry is put into that. And you're saying, I wanna compare them to everybody else. I'm assuming everything else is the same, except for this one risk score that I'm measuring. That's the, the assumptions of exchangeability. And that's not true. And I'm gonna show you what happens with that. And so this other method that we're looking at here, uh, this personalized reference sets, is looking at the K nearest neighbors. So we're saying, if I wanna find a data set that's similar genetically to my index case, then I'm gonna find the people who are similarly genetic, and that's my new reference set. I'm not gonna use these social constructs. I'm not gonna have these broad categories with really diverse people. I'm gonna just match people, right? I'm gonna have these matching things. And this has been a practice, I think, in other components, in clinical trials and sort of in silico things there. Um, but we can do it in genetics as well. And so what does it look like in practice? So here, let's say this is an example. Again, this is the Hispanic Latino individuals in PAGE and how they identify along PC1 and PC2. And so let's say that I had an index person in the middle here for PC, here, this little white dot, you can see right here. Um, you would probably have, you would have them here. You would have compared them to everybody, right? But what you can see is they are very genetically different from people over here and over here. There's diversity within that. So instead, you're matching them to the K nearest neighbors. Uh, it doesn't look as tightly bound because it's actually we use multiple PCs, which are all um, orthogonal to each other. But the idea is that you want your nearest neighbors. And what you're noticing here is that it's, from a, it's not just from their own group, right? There's gonna be members there in the PC space that are Hispanic, people who are African American, whoever's your nearest neighbor, it doesn't matter how people identify as long as they're genetically similar to them, right? Because what you're trying to model, again, is genetic similarity. 
And this is important because as we do genetics and statistics in general, we're very focused on the mean, right? All our stats are oriented to the mean. We forget in some of these groups the variance is very large. So what I'm showing you here is PC1 and PC2, PC2, 1 and PC3 for the Hispanic Latino individuals. And I'm showing you, based on where they are in this PC space, what proportion of their individualized reference set is within the same group. And what you can see is as you get further away to the left-hand side, those individuals, their nearest neighbors in genetic space are not Hispanic Latino according to these self-identified labels. They are something else, right? You have a lower concordance. So while maybe this use of broad groups is doing fine for those in the middle, right, because they're similar and they have that, on the tails you see differences. And so it's important to know for these groups, the tails are very wide. There's a lot of people you're leaving behind on those tails that maybe weren't as much of a concern in previous work and looking at more um, homogenous relationships in populations, but for these recently admixed groups with larger variants, there's a big problem here. And we can quantify this more directly on PC1. What is the concordance, right, with their own group? And what you can see here is that as you go <coughs> on PC1, this is just um, one of them for Hispanic Latino and African American participants. Again, you do pretty well for a lot of people, but a lot of people, their nearest reference set is not that same group, right? So you would have incorrectly matched them to the wrong reference set and possibly gotten incorrect estimations of their genetic risk. Just because you put them into this big bucket, what you think was a relatively sort of uniform population when it's not. And let's give you some examples here. So here, I'm gonna hurry up because I'm running out of time, but here are four individuals. They all identify as being Hispanic Latino, and you can see sort of how they break down with who's in their data sets, right? And so you have person A right there in the middle. Um, 996 out of 1,000 people are also identified as Hispanic Latino, but you have two African American, two others. And the other one, next one on B, um, you have more of the 7,934 Hispanic Latino and then one African American and one Native American individual from the page data set. But then showing you below here, you have people who are C. Again, they are identified as Hispanic Latino, but the majority of their nearest neighbors are African American. And if you delve into the data more, that person is uh, identifies further as being Dominican, right? But they are Hispanic, not Latino. That is the, the valid identity. Um, but you can see that their nearest neighbors were not in that group. So again, shared ancestry between different populations, right? It doesn't make the identity any less valid. It just means in the genetic space, there are other nearest neighbors. And then I want to show you on, the, on D, you know, this person is identified as a Spanish Latino in the data set. That's, that's always a possibility. Their nearest neighbors are Asian and Native Hawaiian individuals. Um, so there's pretty much, well, a few options, but the biggest option is that, yes, they come from a Hispanic country, one of those identified further. Um, the other option is that they're Filipino, and somebody looked at their last name and decided they must be Hispanic, right? So again, the algorithms we use when we classify people based on their names can also have biases if you fail to acknowledge the social political context in which they exist, right? And so it's sort of important to keep in mind when you think about these data and how infallible you think these data sets are and what they're actually capturing. Right, so it's important to note that for the caveats here. And you can see again where these people fall along this with concordance, while some of them have high concordance, some of them have low concordance. And we can also look at the other, sort of the inverse cost there, where how many of them match specifically with African American individuals with Hispanic Latino, and you sort of see the same relationship, where some of them with low concordance do, some of them don't. Again, it's all very complex, and it's sort of important for us, really emphasizes how it's important for us not to go on these sort of racial ethnic lines when we consider genetic diversity and creating these sort of discrete groups, but rather what we're immediately trying to look at here. Now, I'm gonna finish up here with a few more slides, but the idea is that I know that I keep on asking you to make smaller and smaller slices of the data, and there is a cost to this granularity, right? To be more specific about genetic similarity, to be more specific about the environmental context. And the problem is that you're gonna run up against a wall because these sample sizes are small to begin with. They're already small, and I'm essentially asking you to chop them up further and further and further to have a better sort of scientific question and inquiry. And that's a problem. And so this sort of requires us to have this idea of, you know, while we're doing these frameworks, there needs to be increased representation and recruitment of these groups in our data sets in a way that's more equity focused than equality focused, um, and that we've started to address somewhat with all of us. And so we're doing a lot of this work in all of us as well. And again, there's always gonna be a trade-off between the power of your study and the precision of your question, right? You're not working with infinite sized data sets. You're not working with the entire global population. You're working with what you have. And so it's about decisions in the research making progress about what's acceptable and what's not. Um, and I think there's be more conversation about where that line is and what we acceptable and what the incentive structure we have in place 
does with that line, right? Where that influences the line, because we're all sort of part of this ecosystem uh, and need to be addressed for that. So what does it mean for genetics? It means that, again, the, the label of Hispanic Latino when it comes to um, genetics research doesn't make a ton of sense. It's just unified by a language, a history, and that is not necessarily rooted in any kind of environmental um, uniformity, any kind of genetic uniformity, uh, from either the genetic side or the epidemiological side, right? So we should question that use um, broadly. Again, the other thing is that admix individuals and groups are not just the sum of their parts, right? Often we see people looking at local ancestry or breaking things in without failing to account for the fact that these are full people with their own environments and own communities um, that are not just, again, a sum of these parts you can pull from the UK Biobank or other groups, right? Now there's usefulness in this, but there needs to be with some care, which is sort of something about. Models are complex, require diverse data sets, and again, this consideration of precision and power. The last thing, well, not, not the last thing, but one of the last things is this requires a reckoning of us, you know, getting more specific when it comes to these nested hierarchies of what we're modeling, right? You have this genetic similarity on one side, you have race, ethnicity, and social construct on the other, and right now we have a lot of conflation of the two in genetics research, but there needs to be better specificity, and you can't really avoid using both because we are the sum of both, right? And so it's a matter of where you can get precision where you can't, having more thoughtful process to identify it. We all can't be experts at everything. I like this um, cartoon for many reasons, but the idea is that this requires a lot of cross-disciplinary collaboration, right? Lindsay Fernandez Rhodes, who I did the PRS paper from before, um, is trained in social epidemiology, and so that's sort of how that, that collaboration occurred, uh, and it requires this context, right? I know context is a very hot word right now, um, but it requires knowing the context between the, your participants and what your question is, which requires this, this um, field of study. You know, I think a lot of geneticists say, well, we'll just add E, we'll add the E into G by E, and that's fine, without recognizing that's, that's multiple careers worth of work right there, people who have entire expertises and degrees in. So we should do better on that front. And that all goes down about the default, right? I think we need to just question the default. This goes to, you can't fix a broken foundation, right? Like in terms of patching it. You have to sort of reevaluate what's going on and what we accept as a default for questions, who we include, and the systems we model. This is different than the assumptions we make. We all work, you know, I work in stats. We have to make assumptions all the time, but that's different than what we consume as the, as a default and what we expect to happen later on, right? Who we expect to wait their turn uh, versus doing it right now. And then lastly, I've shown people this a lot before, but I still think it's both embarrassing and important to know is that, you know, who are we doing the research for, right? This is a GWAS catalog. This is the composition of people who are in the GWAS catalog. You can see that it does not reflect the world population. It does not reflect the U.S. population. It does reflect us, right? And so I didn't go into this field for strictly, you know, selfish reasons, and I know many of us did not as well. And so it's important for us to think about, you know, how this affects the defaults we have, how can we remedy this, including the workforce and what sort of ideas we reward and the incentive structure um, to do better, I think, from the sort of ground up. With that, I love people to thank, including my lab, the, the RAGE lab, um, and I'm here for any questions you have. Thank you. Oh, yeah. You want to monitor? I don't know. Um, thank you. That was an excellent talk. So I guess, um, does anybody have any questions? Please come to the mic so we can hear you. Um, and we have somebody monitoring questions by Zoom. If our, any of our Zoom participants, um, I guess I'll take the host's uh, um, prerogative and ask a question. So, um, you know, it's... Since this is like not a one size fits all, and humans are obviously very messy, like, and we self report, but maybe we self report differently on different data sets. How do we get people to, and also people report wrongly, or I shouldn't say report wrongly, things get reported wrongly. Um, how do you think we can fix that situation? I think, you know, part of it's just asking people. A lot of the times the fields that we use are not actually people's self-identified labels. They're sort of whatever people, like a provider can look at a person and be like, I'm going to put this person here, and that changes wildly. There's sort of previous studies looking to see 
how different labels can change from visit to visit to visit, depending on the provider. There's also the new OMB categories, which um, are, they combine race, ethnicity, which, you know, there are some challenges with that in that there is more of an emphasis on um, national origin in the new OMB categories. So again, sort of complicating things. But I think, you know, you allow people to, to again, this is the messy answer and it's a lot more work, but you allow people to self-identify themselves. You give them as many options as they want. You can have open fields, which you don't have to use in every analysis, but just having it there for future work can help. Um, but people will tell you who they are, right? And they will tell you who they aren't. Um, and so giving them the space to do that without assuming that they should fit into these boxes. Um, we'll do that. Also, don't make everybody fit into just one box. So allow people to have multiple boxes, which again, is a challenge when looking at the data and actually using the data. Um, but I think it's better to have the data and then figure things out later than to never collect it in the beginning. Yeah. Not particularly a question, kind of yeah. the, more asking your opinion. So um, you add in that our models are very complex because we have to add more and more things yeah. into them. Um, especially in the United States because we're so, such an admixed population. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried to make collaborations with people from like European countries that are much more hom homogenous, like, mm -hmm. like the Estonian yeah. biobank, the Finnish biobank, mm -hmm. where we can like maybe test out some of these things in these mm -hmm. very more, much more homogenous populations before trying to then apply them to our much more complicated oh. process over here? Yeah, I don't do that, but I know people who do it. So I rely on the field to do it. Um, and so there are some studies looking at UK Biobank, particularly, especially because there's such great geospatial data and linkage to the social and structural determinants of health in that data set. Um, and it does hold up in terms of the sort of relationship between environment and polygenic score performance, um, not necessarily because the genetics of a trait is different between groups based on environments, but more how much genetics is allowed to matter differs between these groups based on the environment. I think that's an important sort of distinction, because it's not, again, you're not saying different biological pathways are different based on like where you are geographically necessarily speaking. It's more that you're trying to say, you know, for these differences of performances, there's sort of two ceilings that you have, and one of them is the heritability. Right. And so they've showed differences in heritability, differences in polygenic performance in the UK Biobank by um, geography. Um, it's Abdel Ablawi who's done a lot of work in that space. And there's been some done in, in, in Finland, but the, the, the challenge again is that you have this is balance between having enough diversity to ask the questions, mm -hmm. but not too much diversity to make it super complex. And so there's very few places which have both of those um, at, at a scale, so. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Hi, very nice presentation. Thanks. Um, yes, my, my question was about uh, the analyzing the mixtures. Mm -hmm. Because um, I, I know that admixture is, is increasingly becoming a problem in, mm -hmm. in, in geo studies because they are neither here or there. And uh, from what you've said, like, you cannot say they are addition of both. And so uh, could you share your opinion on how to analyze the, uh, the group that fall in these admixtures? And, um, and, um, and uh, I don't know, will, because even if you say like somebody is 50% admixture, two mm -hmm. people are 50% admixture. Mm -hmm. They're not the same, like in terms of the genome. Yeah. And so, can you comment on that, and also the application of peers on their that group? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So the admixture. I mean, it, so I didn't go into the methods for this paper for this part of it, but I mean, admixture is not uncovering some innate static truth, right? It's about the models you use, and so for that admixture analysis that I showed. We did k equals 2 all the way to k equals 10, did 100 seeds per one, and you pick which one has the best fit for things, right? You'll let the data, in that case, you're saying the algorithm does it, and you take care to make sure in the manuscript that you're saying, like, this is an algorithm, here's all the different runs, all the different k, you can see what comes out, what doesn't come out. And for us, it was important that we actually didn't use reference data for this admixture analysis because um, of the inclusion of different groups that wouldn't align across the different thousand genome sort of boundaries for this. I mean, I think that the issue with, with admixture is it's a little different for us because these are recently admixed groups. And so you are sort of modeling our recent process. The pro, you know, there's, there's always a question of like, are they mixed or are they just in the middle, right? And so this question of how you can disentangle of who you're showing and what you're trying to statement you're making with the data, it needs to be very carefully done to distinguish between those, right? Because not every data set has to have an admixture plot it's very pretty, I loved making it, but it's not necessarily needed for every single study. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, 
like every sort of method, I think there's been more and more scrutiny as to what you're actually trying to say by doing that um, and what people can take away from those plots. Uh, and then it being, again, based on what is necessary for the understanding for your research question, right? Again, for a long time, it was very standard to do certain plots, certain analyses. It's sort of like you do it, get a new data set, you run them through the same pipeline, same pipeline, same pipeline. You do it again. Every paper had the same plots over and over again. Um, and I think that that bubble has burst somewhat uh, with good reason. And so it's more questioning, I think, when you do admixture, why are you doing it? Is it necessary for the question you have at hand? And then the real estate you give it in its paper, do you think that's the main message and why? Hi, um, not a scientific question, just like a personal opinion. Yeah. Me being a, like a Latina, you know, like a Latina category, I just think it's, I really like your talk and I think it's, uh, it's I always had trouble with this classification of Hispanic Latina because really forces you to pick something and there is such a heterogeneous mm -hmm. you know, po population, even in, within the countries, like yeah. you try to subclassify yeah. like Peru, I mean, uh, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and South America, even you know, within each country there is, yeah. maybe some of them might be more homogeneous, maybe mm -hmm. Cuba or Puerto Rico, but especially many countries in South America or like Central America, there is vast uh, indigenous ancestry mm -hmm. And there is also groups that are mostly European yeah. or, or African, and they're very different. Mm -hmm. And maybe, of course, there is also play out of social factors there. But um, I, you know, my <laughs> wish is that one day maybe, as you said, we could have like an open uh, yeah. box so we yeah. can self-classify and maybe tell our own story because yeah. there might be people that want to tell about their ancestry mm -hmm. or how yeah. they identify. And maybe we could have groups of, instead of like countries, you know, like maybe... I, I, gonna, I, don't, I don't know, there's like so many indigenous groups mm -hmm. in, in South America, Quechua, yeah. Mayas, Mixtecs, you know, maybe those groups would reflect better, yes. right? Yeah. The, these parameters and these questions we're trying mm -hmm. to ask. So I just really like it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any last questions? We're over time. I think that's it. We're over. All right. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Yeah.